This is Origin Stories, the Leaky Foundation podcast. I'm Meredith Johnson. On today's episode, you'll meet a Leaky Foundation grantee who'll share what it's like to study an endangered species while at the same time working to help them survive. Okay, you sound great. Okay. Can you tell me your name? Sure. I'm Dr. Zareen Machanda. I'm a professor at Tufts University. Zareen Machanda is also co-director of a long-term chimpanzee research study called the Kibali Chimpanzee Project. The study site is located within the Kibali National Park in Uganda. It's a 306-square-mile forest about the size of New York City. This forest is home to an estimated 1,200 chimpanzees. The Kibali Chimpanzee Project is focused on a community of about 50 to 60 chimps that live in the northwestern section of the forest. The project was started in 1987 by primatologist and Leakey Foundation grantee Richard Rangham. Project members have collected data continuously on these chimps every day for more than 30 years. Zareen Machanda is the director in charge of that data. One of the things that you're tasked with when you study an endangered species is trying to archive the lives of these animals that have a pretty high likelihood of going extinct, potentially in your lifetime, and so that this data may be the only record of that species in the future. And so you really have to think, what is, how do we get everything? How do we collect almost everything we can about this animal before we lose it? And I feel very privileged and lucky to work with such an incredible data set. In addition to managing the long-term data at Kibali, Zareen is a field primatologist. One of her main interests is understanding how and why chimpanzees form social bonds. She's been interested in chimps since she was about five years old, when she saw a TV documentary about chimps in the U.S. space program. In the documentary, I remember they interviewed John Glenn and they interviewed Jane Goodall. And I remember underneath their names, it said astronaut and primatologist. And so I went to the World Book Encyclopedia with the help of my parents. And I was like, what are these things? These seem cool. And I thought they were both really cool. And I couldn't really decide between them. And so I remember having a conversation with my mom about what I wanted to be when I grew up. And I was like, I'm going to be an astronaut veterinarian because they send chimps to space and someone will need to take care of them there. She said something like, I don't think that's a real job. And I was like, of course it is because the chimps are in space and they need someone to take care of them. And it's not a real job. So (laughs) very disappointed. And I'm too short for the space program. So I had to fall back on primatology. (laughs) Zareen knew she wanted to work with wildlife, so she thought wildlife veterinarian was probably the closest she could get to astronaut veterinarian. After high school, she went to McGill University in Quebec to start her pre-veterinary education. And I had one slot for an elective, and I ended up taking prehistoric archaeology and so and human evolution. And so that was like this spark that I figured out that you could study humans with biology. That spark helped Zareen on her path to biological anthropology and eventually primatology. And hilariously, about 10 years later, my husband and I were in a tiny, tiny, tiny bed and breakfast in Peru. And there was only one other couple staying at the B&B. And so they put our tables together. And I remember I asked, they were an older couple, and I said, oh, what are you doing here? And, and the gentleman said, oh, I just retired from my job, so we're, we're taking this kind of dream vacation. And I said, well, what's your job? And he said, I'm a veterinarian for NASA. And I nearly fell off my chair. And my husband, like, I was just like, oh, you mean it's a job? <laughs> I had about 8 million questions for him. And I just had this, like, I was like, that's the... that's the job that I wanted when I was five years old. So it, it is a job, but it's not a job that sends you to space. Back when she was in college, Serene volunteered at a sanctuary for chimps that had been retired from biomedical research. She noticed that they behaved really differently than the wild chimps she was reading about in school, and she wanted to understand why. 
like why are they behaving differently in the wild and in captivity? In particular, I was interested in the relationships between males and females and the fact that females in captivity can be more socially dominant. And I thought that was interesting. And I just thought, maybe I'll try doing a PhD on this. So she applied to do her PhD with Richard Rangham, the founder of the Kibali Chimpanzee Project at Harvard University. She thought that his project in Uganda would be a great place to explore her question about male and female relationships and chimp power dynamics. So she traveled to Uganda to observe chimp relationships in the wild, and she took the data she collected for her dissertation and integrated it with the long-term data from Kibali. Because I had gotten so much experience with the long-term data with my PhD, as I was finishing my PhD, I took over all of the management of the long-term data. And so from there, it has just naturally progressed to becoming this director in charge of that long-term data. As you might imagine, it's a big responsibility to be in charge of a 30-year collection of daily observations like those from Kibali. The data is all digitized and archived, but they still collect their data with pen and paper, the old-fashioned way, like Darwin would have done it. It's, a, it's an amazing, amazing collection of data. We have these incredible behavioral notes of almost every day in the lives of chimps for the last 30 years. I mean, you can look at the data and in the absence of actually being in the field, you can read these detailed notes and put yourself into the field and really live like what a day is like for the chimps. It's like you're reading the most amazing so- script of a soap opera when you're looking at these notes. Kakama aggressed against Eslam and Lonjo, and then he had sex with Lonjo's mother. And you're like, that's the best script of a soap opera. All these juicy behavioral notes are a way to understand chimpanzee life and behavior, and also our own evolution. And when you're working with an endangered species like chimps, doing studies that observe them for decades, these daily observations are priceless. They are a repository of incredible amounts of data and information about these animals and these individuals. I mean, we know more about our individual chimpanzees' lives and habits and preferences than you would know about most of your friends, right? Like, how many of your friends could you actually calculate an average copulation length for? Probably none of them, right? But we can do that for our chimps, and that's the kind of, I know it's a joke, but it's That's the richness of this data, that we have so much more detail on these lives of chimps than most human studies have. And that's incredibly valuable. And so so I I just want to highlight how important, and it's not just chimps, it's capuchins, it's baboons, it's all orangutans, it's all of these species of primates. Because they're long-lived, we need this long-term data from the wild and they're going extinct, and we're losing these field sites, and we're losing these species. If we do lose chimps in the wild, the ones that will be last here are the ones that are being studied, right? They're the best protected ones on Earth, so there is so much value to to those sites. And there's another reason why long-term field research is so important. In addition to protecting endangered primates, long-term studies let scientists like Zarin and hopefully other scientists far into the future, ask and answer fundamental questions about primate behavior, human evolution, and more. So it's a real privilege to have access to that data and to be able to work with it on a daily basis. And I think when you do a PhD and you're collecting data in the field over the course of a year, you get these really amazing detailed notes for that project. And then when you shift towards long-term data, You can imagine when you're doing a PhD, you have this question that you're trying to answer. So you set up your data collection to answer that question. When you set up long-term data collection for primate field sites, you have to set it up in such a way to answer a question you don't know you'll have 10 years from now. Zareen actually put this to the test shortly after she became director of data. I always feel like science is much, much, much more creative than people 
think it is. And especially when you're working in the wild, you have all of these challenges. You have a question, how are you actually going to answer it with the limitations you have in the wild? And so actually a good example of that is one of our leaky funded projects, which was trying to understand when baby chimpanzees get their teeth. So dental development. If you listened to our last episode about teeth, you know how important teeth are for understanding growth and development in humans. The same is true for chimps. All apes, including us, have the same number and the same kinds of teeth. All apes also have baby teeth, just like we do, that they lose when their adult teeth come in. Learning how and when young wild chimpanzees get their teeth and when they stop nursing is an important way for scientists to learn about how chimpanzees grow and develop and how this compares to humans and other apes. Not only that, but understanding child development in chimps, our closest relatives, can shed light on the evolution of one of the most interesting things about humans, our super long childhoods. Field primatology is a hands-off kind of science. Researchers can't get close to chimps or just ask them to open their mouths. Previous studies had relied on captive apes or on finding teeth from chimps that died when they were young. But it's rare to find skeletons of juvenile chimps. And you don't know why they died. And they may have died because of something diet-related or tooth-related or skeletal-related. And it, that was one of those moments where it was kind of like sitting around trying to th think about this issue and this problem and then someone just saying, why don't you just take photos of baby chimps with their mouths open? And we're like... Why don't we take photos of baby chimps with their mouths open? Zareen and her collaborator, Tanya Smith, the tooth expert you heard from in our last episode, applied for a Leaky Foundation grant to try this new idea. We took 9,000 photos of baby chimps with their mouths open and were able to publish two studies on dental development and when baby chimps get their teeth in living wild chimpanzees. This was maybe the most adorable study ever funded by the Leaky Foundation but it did more than build a collection of cute baby chimp photos. Zareen and Tanya Smith and their collaborators compared the open mouth photos with long-term data on the individuals and what they were up to when different kinds of teeth like molars and canines emerged. They looked at their nursing behavior, records of what else they were eating, and hormone information from urine samples. And what they found surprised them. 20 years of previous studies had found that juvenile chimps stopped nursing after their first molars erupted. This new research showed that wasn't the case. In fact, the young chimps continued to nurse as much or more, even though they were eating plenty of other food. And with seed money from that one Leaky Foundation grant, Zareen and Tanya have now built a new method and a new photographic data set that other researchers can use for years to come. I mean, it's an immense library at this point. I think we have almost, at this point, not just the teeth photos, but probably almost close to 80 to 100,000 photographs of various things. And I mean, how valuable that's going to be in the future. And, and it opens up the kinds of questions that we can ask and answer that we haven't been able to do. We don't know what questions we're going to have of that in the future, but I know we'll use those. Her work at Kibali lets Zareen examine chimp life from many angles. She's still interested in the social relationships research that first brought her to Kibali. One of the things that ended up happening with my thesis is that I went out to study the potential for male-female bonds in the wild, and they don't really have them. So, and that's not a bad thing. I mean, it's not a bad thing that they don't. It's actually a very interesting thing in comparison to humans. and. I, I often give the example that for one of the studies that we were doing, we were looking at grooming. And in a data set where we had over 2,000 grooming events between males in that same time frame, where we had pretty equal hours of observation of males and females, we had 32 grooming events between females. So there was just an order of magnitude difference, two orders of magnitude difference between male, male grooming and female-female grooming. So female chimpanzees are amazing and interesting. With respect to social relationships, they're just very different. And so we have, we have more data on the males. Zareen and another of her colleagues, psychologist Alexandra Rosati, 
used long-term data from Kibali to see how chimpanzee friendships and other social relationships changed as male chimps aged. There's a theory in psychology called socio-emotional selectivity theory. It's this idea that as we get older, our priorities change, and we become more picky about how we spend our time and who we spend our time with. It, it's grounded in this idea that humans have a sense of mortality, and because they have a sense of time and mortality, they shift their behavior with age. And specifically, they have this positivity bias. So humans don't have time for negativity. Positivity bias means that people focus on and prioritize positive feelings. And when we know we're running out of time, instead of making new friends, we focus on strong, long-term friendships that make us feel good. And I think part of this theory is it comes out because people were concerned that older individuals were, were not socially integrated enough. And so they are thinking, like, we need to just increase sociality for, for older people, and that will make them happy. And most of the older people responded, but I am happy. I have my friends. I like those people. I don't need new friends. And so I think it was that idea. Is there a time when they when you see this start to happen? And so it's actually a little more complicated that it's not just about aging in humans. It's more about our sense, our understanding of time horizons. So that there are going to be shifts in life where certain things end. So you might see the same result in like people who are in college. So like the last day of college, you're going to spend time with your old friends, not make new friends. So it's more about that time horizons. So you may have multiple time horizons over the course of your life and death is the ultimate time horizon. So that's one that affects everybody. Zareen and Alexandra Rosati were interested in whether chimpanzees have similar changes in their social behavior and in their relationships as they age, even though chimps are not known for their sense of future time. There's not much data that suggests that there's a lot of future-oriented thinking in chimps, especially past a few days. Most of it, that kind of planning data, the evidence that they might have planning is about tool use and is on the order of maybe a few days, but not like years in advance. My gut, having spent many years with chimps, is that they don't have a sense of mortality. But I mean, I guess the question to challenge your listeners with is how would you know? What kind of test would you do to test that someone has a sense of mortality? And how would you test it in a nonverbal species? Right? I mean, we can talk about it, but how would you do it with something that you can't talk to? The way they handled the challenge was by combing through the data from more than 78,000 hours of observations of male chimps between the ages of 15 and 58, which is an advanced age for a chimp. They looked at measures of chimp social relationships like proximity, grooming, and aggression. So looking for measures of mutual friendship compared to lopsided friendships, you might expect young individuals to have more like I'm going to meet, I'm going to spend time with these individuals that are, are going to give me information and perhaps help me reach higher rank, whereas older individuals might prioritize hanging out with someone who reciprocates. They found that like humans, aging male chimps prioritize strong mutual friendships, and they show a shift towards more positive, less aggressive behavior towards the whole community. Why they do this is still a mystery to be solved. It could be that strong bonds and a positive attitude are good strategies to keep older chimps in the mix and help them continue to get mating opportunities. Finding patterns so similar to our own in aging chimps shows that these changes in relationships can happen even without a sense of your own mortality. And this research gives some intriguing clues about how our own social behaviors evolved. Zareen and her collaborators are planning more research with the Kabali chimpanzees along these lines. And to ensure that's possible, she feels a responsibility to protect them. I think if you are going to devote your career to studying an endangered species, you selfishly are going to spend a lot of your time protecting that animal, that species. I mean, from a completely selfish perspective, you want something for you to study 30 years from now. You want, you want something to be there for your students to study 30 years from now. And so I think you're going to, I, I mean, I think I'm surprised still how, 
that that's part of my job today, but it really is if you want to devote your life to that kind of study. Our approach is really two-pronged. We understand the need for protecting the chimps within the park, but we also think it's really important to work with people, local people outside of the park to increase conservation. So within the park, the Kibali Chimpanzee Project runs a snare removal project, employing local rangers who patrol the forest to remove snares illegally set by poachers. So we have a number of chimps who've been injured by snares, lost feet, lost hands, lost fingers, just had have def- deformities because of that. And so that's one way that we're monitoring illegal activity within the park. And Richard Rangham has always put and he's the one that started our site, but he's always put forth the idea that long-term research can have an incredible conservatory effect for grade eight populations. And part of that is that recognizing that manpower of local authorities can sometimes be limited to monitor all the, le- all the activity in the park. And the presence of researchers is this extra protection. We're in the forest every day with these animals to the point that If you want to do illegal activity in the park, why would you go to the area where someone's going to be in there every day monitoring it? So long-term research can have just this kind of almost trickle-down protective effect. They also partner with a sister organization, the Cassisi Project, which was started by Dr. Elizabeth Ross. This program is focused on nearby schools, and it involves building classrooms, getting books for libraries, providing scholarships, running lunch programs and health programs... I wear many hats in my career. I think that was actually a surprise to think about when I finished grad school or when I even was in grad school, thinking about what would your day be like? Would I be actually like teaching kids in Uganda how to make maxi pads that were sustainable maxi pads? Did not think I'd be doing that. You end up wearing all sorts of hats. And so I'm on the board of directors for the Cassisi Project and The mission there, which I love, is this idea that you can't just go into a local community or a school and start preaching conservation or telling everyone how amazing chimps are. You have to have a really holistic approach to conservation. The Cassisi Project works with around 10,000 kids at schools that are within five kilometers of the border of the national park. Our mandate is, is just, let's make these schools as amazing as possible. Let's try to give these schools and these kids as many opportunities and as much access to education, literacy, everything that we can, that we can do. And let's allow them the opportunity to grow up and pursue careers that don't necessarily involve cutting down the forest or poaching from the park when they're older. In addition to increasing education and health and literacy for kids, Zareen and her colleagues hope their work will help shift attitudes towards chimps and the forest. And because we're scientists, we end up taking a lot of data on on this project as well. And we are sh- we're, we are seeing shifts in attitudes and shifts in how students report feeling about chimpanzees. And we get we get the I, th- I think what's happening is that there's this trickle down effect to the parents and to the local community. So just like kids here force their parents to recycle because they've learned it in school, we see some similar effects. And there are things you can do to help protect endangered primates, no matter where you live. For starters, you can use your purchasing power. I think people who are familiar with primates and con- conservation will know that products that have palm oil in them are doing harm to orangutan habitats around Asia. And so that those are those might be small things, but like from on a day-to-day kind of perspective, you do have to be cognizant of the things that you're buying. And I think that's a thing that more people could be aware of, of your purchasing power. I think also we have to be aware of our presence and on social media and some of the things that we are liking and forwarding. And so Before you forward that cute picture of a chimpanzee wearing some hat or someone holding a baby chimpanzee or posing for a photo with a captive endangered animal, be aware that you might be perpetuating attitudes towards these animals that are actually doing more harm than good. I think that's an important thing. And I mean, I don't want anyone to get in huge, horrible fights with their friends, but, you know, maybe maybe tell people that. When you post that kind of thing, it actually does a lot of harm. 
So I think those are two small things that people can do. I think telling everyone how amazing chimpanzees are or whatever primate you love. I think just getting as much information about them out there, as much awareness. So tell everyone. I mean, if you love proboscis monkeys, tell everybody about them. (laughs) I mean, I think those are small things. If we all do small things like that, I think that can help. Yeah, you're welcome. For now, since the pandemic, Zareen has had to watch the Kibali Chimpanzee Project from afar. She and the rest of the project members are being very cautious, and their priority is to keep the staff and the chimps as safe as possible. She plans to return when non-Ugandan researchers can safely go back to the forest. Thanks to Dr. Zareen Machanda for sharing her work. We'll put links to her research and website in the show notes. Origin Stories is a project of the Leakey Foundation, a nonprofit dedicated to funding human origins research and sharing discoveries. One of the most important things the Leakey Foundation does is provide funding for long-term field research like the Kibali Chimpanzee Project. The Leakey Foundation's Primate Research Fund helps keep long-term primate studies going no matter what. We provide emergency funding to projects facing a gap in their usual funding or other emergencies that threaten their ability to collect data. During the pandemic, we've had more applications than ever, so we need your help. We're trying to raise a total of $25,000 for this fund. Every donation up to that total amount will be matched by Anne and Jeff Magincalda and matched again by the Anne and Gordon Getty Foundation. Any amount helps. Use the link in your show notes to contribute to this important fund, and your gift will be quadruple matched. You can hear more from Zareen and her collaborator, Alexandra Rosati. They're giving a virtual talk about their chimpanzee research on April 7th at 7 p.m. Eastern. This talk is presented by the Leakey Foundation and the American Museum of Natural History. It's free, so don't miss it. RSVP using the link in your show notes. You can also learn more about Zareen's research on our web series, Lunch Break Science. She was the very first guest. You can find that episode and more on our YouTube channel. Sign up for reminders and join us live every first and third Thursday at 11 a.m. Pacific. Go to leakyfoundation.org slash live for all the details. This episode was produced by me, Meredith Johnson. Our editor is Audrey Quinn. Theme music by Henry Nagel. Additional music by Blue Dot Sessions and Lee Rosevere. Thank you so much for your reviews and your five-star ratings. I read all of them, and your support of the show makes me so happy. We'll be back next month with a brand new episode. As always, thanks for listening.